Arizona Governor Janet Napolitano was nominated in 2008 by President Barack Obama to become the Secretary of Homeland Security. Under her tenure, DHS became the nation's third largest cabinet department, dealing with new generations of terrorism, airport security, border and immigration issues, and pandemic threats. Napolitano created the legal framework for DACA and invested heavily in border and airport security technology, as well as programs like TSA PreCheck. In 2013, Napolitano left DHS to become the first woman president of the University of California. She is the author of How Safe Are We?, a critique of American security measures in the age of cyber warfare. Governor Napolitano, welcome to Seattle, and thank you for being part of CrossCut Now. Yeah, you know, thanks for having me. You have been connected to every pressing issue, border security, cyber security, immigration, domestic terrorism. What keeps you up at night? Well, frankly, I've always been a pretty good sleeper, which I think is an essential quality for the Secretary of Homeland Security. But um, there are uh, some risks that I think our country is not paying enough attention to. Cybersecurity, uh, the risks associated with global warming, okay. uh, mass gun violence, those are uh, top three on, on my list. And so when I think about the safety of the United States, the security of Americans, uh, my thoughts tend to go in those directions. When you're reading the news accounts, and certainly uh, we just had, unfortunately, another shooting at a synagogue just last week, um, and I, I can't imagine what it's like to read those headlines. Where does your mind go to immediately when you see that, when you hear those stories? Well, uh, these terrible stories and... Um, uh, you know, the concern is the rise of uh, right-wing extremism, white nationalism. Uh, we saw that um, increasing during the years of the Obama administration. We've seen uh, a dramatic increase in the years since the Obama administration. We don't, you know, really have a good handle on how to uh, identify and prevent uh, uh, acts of violence by those who are self-radicalized and then go out and buy a combat-ready weapon and take it out on a synagogue or uh, a school or a church. Um, you come from a border state, and in your book you write about uh, the frustration you would sometimes have in having people talk to you about immigration reform and having little knowledge about what actually happens on the border. What do you think Americans don't understand are not getting about life on the U.S. border, um, the I, southern border? I, I think what um, uh, they're not getting is that building a wall is a symbol. It's not a strategy. Um, and that uh, for the southwest border, um, you have these major ports of entry through which hundreds of thousands of vehicles go every day. Mexico's our third leading trade partner. Hundreds of thousands of jobs in the United States are uh, related to uh, that trade um, through those ports of entry. So we really need to support those ports of entry. And then uh, between the ports, uh, you need a combination of manpower, technology, you know, ground sensors, tunnel detection equipment, air cover, drones. Uh, and it's, it's that combination that gives us the most secure border that we can have, recognizing that you, it, the border is not like a big Ziploc bag. You can't just seal, seal it, it off. No, it's 1,940 miles of varied terrain. Uh, some of the, the, those border lands are public lands, a lot are private lands, some are sovereign Indian nations. Uh, so the notion that you're just going to somehow build a wall and that will cure all our problems, like I said, it's a symbol, it's not a strategy. Why aren't we able to address and actually institute some sort of immigration reform? Boy, that's, uh, you know, that's the $64,000 question, isn't it? Um, look, immigration reform requires a real plan for the southwest border, a strategy, as I've described. It uh, requires visa reform uh, so that we meet the growing labor needs of the United States. Uh, and it requires some method by which those already in the country illegally can earn their way to citizenship. Uh, and 
That's you know the three-legged stool that a comprehensive immigration reform plan would would contain. And actually, uh, while I was secretary, the U.S. Senate passed such a plan. Uh, it was the plan sponsored by the so-called Gang of Eight. It was bipartisan. Uh, went to the House and died. And uh, you know, since then, immigration has been the third rail uh, in our Congress. But I'll tell you. Uh, unless and until Congress really grapples with this issue, and maybe they can uh, break it in, into chunks, right? Maybe they don't need to do the whole thing all in one package. Um, but until they begin to grapple uh, with it, it's going to remain this horribly divisive issue in our country. Can you talk to me a little bit about your time as secretary? Did you have to separate families? Are there things, when you look back, sort of like what is the greatest moral quandary that you faced in, in such a delicate, difficult situation that is immigration? Occasionally and rarely we did have to separate uh, children from the adults they were traveling with. Um, it was when uh, we had suspicions that the adults they were with were not related to them, uh, where the children may have been the subject of human trafficking. Uh, so should we have these DNA swabs? Should we be swabbing people to make sure that they're related? To yeah, no, that's an idea. Um, uh, but one thing we shouldn't have is uh, what we saw last year, which is uh, the, the, the zero tolerance policy. So the way the zero tolerance policy worked is that anyone caught crossing the border illegally was immediately put into criminal prosecution. Mm -hmm. Deportation is civil. civil. Um, once you're put into criminal prosecution, uh, that means that children can't go with the adults because children can't be held in, in the same kind of facilities. Uh, and that's what caused this massive dislocation of children from uh, their parents and, and their families. And, you know, the, the real kind of, just from a government management uh, aspect of it, uh, you know, the fact that they had no plan for how to handle these children and how to reunite these children with their parents, um, that, that was just government malpractice. But what's wrong with thinking about protecting ourselves, protecting our borders, keeping us safe when some of us are moving through the world and feeling vulnerable? Yeah, there's nothing wrong. Uh, uh, and in fact, you know, I don't, you know, I don't support an open border policy. I don't support abolition of ICE. Uh, every country in the world is entitled to protect its borders and to determine who is legally entitled to reside in the country. The challenge for the United States is how we go about doing that. Uh, and what do we do about the 10 to 11 million people who already reside in the United States? Um, they work in the United States, they own businesses, some are in the military, they're raising their families here. Uh, the vast majority have not violated any other law but for the fact that they're undocumented. How do we deal with that population? How do you say yes to one person applying for a visa or for asylum and say, and, and say no to somebody else? It's the, um, the rule of law. So the answer with respect to what's been going on at the southwest border is to really flood the zone with the rule of law. Bring more immigration judges okay. to the border. Bring administrative law judges from other departments of the federal government. Fast Give them track some the training. Give them some training. Uh, um, uh, adjudicate the cases right at the border first. Uh, don't have them necessarily go in the back of the line. Uh, there's a way to manage this uh, issue, and we just haven't seen that kind of management. When you're talking about immigration reform and you're, you're suggesting things like more administrative judges on the border, where would you get the money? What would you spend less on in terms of, of the country and its operation to deliver more money in those areas? Uh, I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't spend uh, all those billions on building a wall. I'd spend it on dealing with the source of uh, the migration that we're seeing. And I'll tell you, we have uh, an example where this has worked. So 
We know that these families are coming from El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras because of gang violence, um, because uh, of the failure of civil institutions, law enforcement, the judiciary, etc. Uh, these are countries really in bad shape. Well, not too long ago, Colombia was a narco state, and uh, we had something called Plan Colombia. The United States uh, worked with uh, Colombians who did not want to live in a narco state, uh, and uh, you know, slowly but surely chipped away at that, so that now Colombia is essentially a tourist destination. So we know when we uh, persistently. Uh, uh, apply resources and our smarts to these issues, we can turn off this faucet. We, that's where we ought to go and um, not put all those billions into, into a wall. Were you surprised by the college admission scandal? I was angered by the college cheating scandal. And, and I call it a cheating scandal. Because, angered because you thought that the system was fair? Uh, angered uh, by uh, the notion that people were trying to buy their way into admissions. And um, look, uh, you know, I'm president of the University of California. It's the largest and best public research university system in the world. Um, and, and even we were touched by this. We had a soccer you coach, had a soccer who, took coach a, who took a bribe. But on the, on, on the other hand, uh, we uh, don't have legacy admissions. You don't get an advantage if your family went to UC. We don't have donor-related admissions. Um, uh, we have hundreds of thousands of young people apply every year. And we believe they ought to be, you know, admitted on, on their merits. And so anybody trying to um, get around that, it, it angers me. And I'll, and I'll tell you, I think this case really touched a nerve uh, in our country because it went right at that suspicion of white privilege uh, and elitism uh, in higher education. Thank you very much, Governor Napolitano. Thank you.